Monica has been a super productive. She's been um, an amazing student. So um, she came to the lab actually from MIT where she was an undergrad working with Alice Ting in the chemical engineering program there. And uh, she, along with another student, started this project in my lab. Um, and she's just been wonderful to work with and um, really independent in all her work. And so um, I'm excited to hear her talk today. As Marty said, she actually graduated last summer. <laughs> so she's being called back to serve. And, and you know that is also very accommodating of her. Um, she's now a postdoc with David Liu, um, also doing very interesting things there. And so uh, thank you again, Monica. And I'm looking forward to your talk. My name is Monica, and I'm from Michelle Chang's group at UC Berkeley. And I'm really excited to tell you today about our work in the lab converting a hydroxylase into a halogenase through reaction pathway engineering. In Michelle Chang's group, we use nature as an inspiration for new catalysts. So we discover unique metabolites, identify the biosynthetic genes responsible for making those molecules, and harness the encoded proteins as new catalysts for challenging chemical transformations. And today, the transformation I'll be focusing on is halogenation. We're really interested in organohalogens because they provide a unique opportunity to combine synthetic biology and synthetic chemistry. So what we envision is that taking advantage of the high selectivity of enzymes, we can install halogen functional groups into molecules, which would then make them amenable to downstream modification. So organohalogens are really useful in synthetic chemistry, but how can they be made in nature? There are a number of different classes of halogenases in nature. One class are electrophilic halogenases. These enzymes use flavin and oxygen or hydrogen peroxide to generate an X plus equivalent, which can then modify electron rich substrates. Another class are nucleophilic halogenases. These enzymes activate halide as an anion for nucleophilic attack on S adenosyl methionine, kicking methionine off as a leaving group. And finally, the class that our lab is interested in in this talk are radical halogenases. So these are iron dependent enzymes that use oxygen and alpha ketoglutarate to generate a substrate radical in the active site, which can rebound with a halogen to yield a carbon halogen bond. We're really excited about these because they act even on unactivated CH bonds, which are really challenging to modify selectively with traditional synthetic methods. For completeness, I also wanted to mention that there is a new class of radical halogenases exemplified by CLC, which was recently discovered by Emily Balskis' group at Harvard. But for the purposes of today's talk, I'll focus on the alpha ketoglutarate dependent enzymes. Now, when we began this project, there weren't that many uh, radical halogenases that had been discovered and reported to date. Nearly all radical halogenases that have been reported have a strict requirement for a carrier protein tethered substrate. So for example, CRB2 can chlorinate threonine to chlorothreonine, but only when it's tethered to the carrier protein CRB1. Excitingly, in 2014, this enzyme WELO5 was discovered, and it's the first enzyme ever reported to halogenate a freestanding substrate directly without the requirement for a carrier protein. When we began this project, our lab was really interested in seeing if we could expand the substrate scope of halogenases and find new halogenases that might act on simple small molecules, which could be good precursors to feed into downstream synthetic biosynthetic pathways. And so today I'll briefly touch on how we discovered such a halogenase. I'll tell you about how we looked at homologs to further expand the substrate scope of halogenation. And then the main part of my talk will be engineering hydroxylases, which are a related family of enzymes to perform halogenation instead. So we began this project by trying to understand how this molecule is made. This is beta thionyl serine, and it is a naturally occurring amino acid made in the organism Streptomyces cattleya. Beta thionyl serine has a terminal alkyne functional group, which is very rare in nature, but useful for bioorthogonal chemistry. So we thought it'd be really interesting to understand how this molecule is made. I don't have time to talk about this work in detail, but through a combination of comparative metabolomics and in vitro reconstitution, our group was able to elucidate the full pathway toward beta thionyl serine biosynthesis. And excitingly, we saw that the very first step of the pathway was chlorination of the amino acid lysine to form 4-chlorolysine by the enzyme BESD. We think this is really cool because BESD is the first halogenase 
ever reported to act directly on an amino acid without the requirement for a carrier protein. And because amino acids are key building blocks in cells, we think this is a great opportunity to feed chlorinated precursors into downstream pathways. And for completeness, I want to mention that new halogenases are being discovered more in recent years, for example, ADE5, which acts on a nucleotide substrate. So for BESD, we wanted to better understand how the enzyme is able to act directly on an amino acid without a carrier protein. So the first thing that we did was solve a crystal structure of BESD, the lysine halogenase. On the left, I'm showing the overall fold of the enzyme. And on the right, I'm showing electron density for lysine in yellow, which is a substrate, as well as the cofactors iron, alpha ketoglutarate, and chlorine in the active site, which will end up in the product. The fact that we had a lysine bound crystal structure allowed us to interrogate the residues that are involved in lysine binding. And so briefly, I just want to mention that there are polar contacts between the active site and the carboxylate and amines of lysine that lock it into place. And we have tryptophan 239, which stacks over the aliphatic side chain of lysine. So now that we know how this enzyme is able to bind a free amino acid for catalysis, we wondered if we could identify new amino acid halogenases which brings me to the brief second part of my talk. To further expand the substrate selectivity of these enzymes, we assembled a phylogenetic tree of homologs of BESD. And then we cloned halogenase genes from various branches of the tree in order to maximize diversity. We expressed and purified these from E. coli and assayed them for activity against amino acids. And a lot of this work was done with Kiara Sumita, a fantastic undergraduate in our lab. To summarize, using this strategy, we're able to discover a number of new amino acid halogenation catalysts. In addition to BESD, which makes four chlorolysine, we discovered the enzyme HAL-B, which instead regioselectively modifies C5 and also performs dichlorination of C5. The enzyme HAL-C dichlorinates lysine at C4. HAL-D selectively chlorinates the shorter five carbon substrate ornithine rather than the six carbon substrate lysine and HAL-E modifies aliphatic amino acids like leucine, isoleucine, and norleucine. So one strategy that we were able to take to expand the substrate scope of halogenation is to look to nature and see what homologs exist. An additional approach that we could take to expand the substrate scope is through engineering. And so this will be the main part of my talk focused on how we can engineer hydroxylases to perform halogenation instead. To motivate this part of the talk, I'll discuss a brief mechanism of how halogenases work. So these enzymes coordinate the catalytic iron with two active site histidine residues, with alpha ketoglutarate, and with chlorine, which coordinates iron directly and will end up in the final product. Upon oxygen binding, the enzyme catalyzes decarboxylation of alpha ketoglutarate to succinate to generate a high valent iron peroxis species, which can abstract a hydrogen atom from the substrate, leaving a substrate radical in the active site. Now the substrate radical can rebound with the halogen to yield a carbon halogen bond. However, one thing to note is that at this key intermediate, there is another possible outcome in addition to halogenation. It's also possible for the substrate radical to rebound with the hydroxyl group instead, which would give you a hydroxylated product. And a question that's been really interesting in the field is how is it that halogenases selectively favor the pathway on the right when the pathway on the left is possible as well. So namely, what is it that controls the partitioning between the chlorine versus the hydroxyl rebound? There's been a lot of really beautiful work in this area, and this is not a comprehensive list, but I wanna mention um, that through this work, there have been discovered a lot of factors that disrupt halogenation selectivity and lead to hydroxylation instead. So for example, active site mutagenesis of key second sphere residues, use of non-native substrates, those can all break halogenation and cause the enzyme to perform hydroxylation. And taken together, this paints the picture that the precise positioning of the substrate relative to the potential rebounding groups is really important for determining the outcome. So there are a lot of ways to break a halogenase and cause it to perform hydroxylation, but can we do the opposite of that? Can we go the other way, starting with a hydroxylase and engineer an enzyme to perform halogenation instead? To motivate this, I'll tell you a little bit more about the active sites of these two enzymes. So the halogenases, as I mentioned, have a chlorine coordinated directly to the iron in the active site. And this is facilitated by the presence of a glycine or alanine amino acid residue, which is small enough to create a binding pocket and space for chlorine to coordinate directly to iron. 
In contrast, hydroxylases don't have a glycine or alanine there, and instead they have an aspartate or glutamate residue, which coordinates iron directly, leaving no room for chlorine to coordinate and causing hydroxylation to be the only possible outcome. So you might wonder, could you engineer a hydroxylase to perform halogenation simply by grafting the HXGA motif of halogenases into hydroxylases? This has been attempted for a number of different enzymes like tau D and prolyl for hydroxylase with little success. And it wasn't until Amy Bull's group at Penn State was able to engineer SAD A did we realize that experimentally that you could engineer a hydroxylase to perform halogenation. And taken together, this really paints the picture that it's really quite complicated. And there are factors other than the HXD versus HXG motif that must be contributing to the reaction outcome. So how can we identify those factors? What our lab decided to do was to try to compare a closely related halogenase and hydroxylase. So on the right, I'm showing a phylogenetic tree that our lab made. So we took BESD, which is the lysine halogenase, and we did a blast search and got a bunch of homologs. And we assembled all of those homologs onto a tree. The halogenases are shown in red and they're annotated because they had an HXG or A motif. And the hydroxylases, which are shown in blue, are annotated as such because they have the HXD or E motif. What you see is that for the most part, everything with an HXD or E or a hydroxylase grouped separately on the tree. But there was one exception. There's this one enzyme shown in blue here, which had an HXD motif that clustered with the halogenases. And strikingly, this putative hydroxylase, which our lab decided to call hydrox for the purposes of this talk, is 71% identical in sequence to its nearest halogenase neighbor. So we thought that the really high sequence identity would provide us an exciting opportunity to tease out the key sequence components that lead to the divergent activities. The first thing that we did was to characterize the hydroxylase. So we purified the enzyme and assayed it and saw that it made hydroxylated products and we did not observe any halogenation. In contrast, the halogenase that is closely related performs halogenation with chlorolysine shown in red. Then we wondered if we make the HXD to HXG mutation, could we convert the enzyme? And consistent with previous attempts, making that catalytic mutation was not able to convert the hydroxylase to perform halogenation. So this tells us that we must be missing something. So what other differences are there between the enzyme that performs hydroxylation and one that performs halogenation? To investigate this question, my lab mate Eli was able to solve the crystal structure of the lysine 4 halogenase. And that's shown here on the left in gray. Its overall fold is overlaid with the best D halogenase, the structure which I showed earlier, and that is shown in blue. And what you can see is that these two enzymes overlay quite well structurally. On the right, I'm showing electron density for the cofactors, as well as the lysine substrate that Eli was able to get bound in the active site. And this allows us to ask the question, are there differences in the substrate orientation in these two enzymes that could explain the divergent outcomes? However, we see when we do the alignment that the lysine binding site is highly conserved. The residues are either identical or very similar, and it doesn't seem to explain the differences in reactivity. But when we took a closer look at the enzyme, we did see differences in the orientation of the cofactor alpha-ketoglutarate. So first I want you to focus on the structure shown in gray, and that's the hydroxylase. In the hydroxylase, alpha-ketoglutarate is directly trans from histidine 209. In contrast, in the halogenase, which is shown in blue, alpha-ketoglutarate is rotated by about 20 degrees relative to its position in the hydroxylase. And this seems to be facilitated by hydrogen bonding with asparagine 225 in the halogenase active site. In contrast, the hydroxylase has a valine at that position, which is not capable of hydrogen bonding. So this structure led us to hypothesize that perhaps this hydrogen bond was important for influencing the reaction outcome. And one thing that we thought is that hydrogen bonding could influence the orientation of alpha-ketoglutarate as well as the key intermediate prior to rebound. So in the hydroxylase, valine does not hydrogen bond to alpha-ketoglutarate or to the hydroxyl group, and the hydroxyl group rebounds readily in the hydroxylase. In contrast, in BESD, asparagine 225 can hydrogen bond with alpha-ketoglutarate and potentially as well with the hydroxyl intermediate prior to rebound, thereby favoring halogen rebound instead. So we wondered if we could introduce asparagine 225 into the hydroxylase to engineer halogenase. 
when we did this, we saw a slight improvement in halogenation activity. So now halogenation is the dominant outcome. However, the overall activity is still quite low and the selectivity is poor. So we wanted an unbiased approach to identify other key components. And to that, we for that, we designed a shuffle library. In our shuffle library, we took the sequence for halogenase and for the hydroxylase point mutant, and we digested these pieces of DNA with DNase and reassembled them with PCR to make a shuffle library. And the question that we want to ask is, does each member of the shuffle library perform halogenation or hydroxylation? And with this, our goal is to identify the parts of the protein sequence that lead to halogenation. To screen the shuffle library, we looked to the pathway in which we discovered Bestie in the first place. So Bestie makes four chlorolysine, and then in two downstream steps, this can be converted into propargylglycine, the terminal alkyne containing amino acid. The terminal alkyne functional group can then react with a fluorogenic probe to yield a fluorescent product if our shuffle variant is a halogenase. In contrast, if the variant performs hydroxylation, this is not a substrate for the two downstream enzymes, so we get no alkyne biosynthesis in the cells and we see no fluorescent product. So using this screen, we screened 216 chimeras in 96 whole plate format and found that 30 of the 216 were halogenases. We then sequence those 30 halogenases. And the question we want to ask is, are certain parts of the sequence conserved in our halogenase hits? This graph is a little bit confusing, but I'll try to walk through it. On the x-axis, we're showing the sequence position for all 260 amino acids along the length of the halogenase sequence. And on the y-axis, we're showing the percent conservation of the wild-type halogenase residue in our hits. So for example, asparagine 225, which was that hydrogen bonding residue I pointed out earlier, is actually conserved in 100% of our halogenase hits from the shuffle library. We took a closer look and saw that this residue, isoleucine 151, is also conserved in 100% of the halogenase hits, and it resides next to asparagine 225 in three-dimensional space. So we thought that the relative positioning of these two residues may be important for determining the reaction outcome. And we decided to add both asparagine 151i and valine 225n into the hydroxylase to see if we could engineer a halogenase. And we were really excited to see that the triple mutant containing these two residues, in addition to the residue uh, to the mutation in the facial triad, was able to give us a halogenase with comparable selectivity to that of the wild type halogenase. Furthermore, we saw that adding asparagine 151i by itself was not sufficient. The enzyme is still a hydroxylase. So it's really important that you have both of these residues, the hydrogen bonding one and the one adjacent in order to engineer a halogenase. However, we can see that the overall activity of this triple mutant is quite a bit lower than that of the wild type halogenase. And we wanted to see if we could do a little bit better. So we turned back to our shuffle library and we decided to map all the residues that were conserved in 100% of our halogenase hits onto the structure. So on the left, I'm showing the structure of the hydroxylase. And in blue, I'm showing the residues that were conserved in 100% of our hits from the shuffle library. And what's really striking to us is that all of these hits lie along two beta strands within the coupon core of the enzyme. On the right, I'm showing these two strands in isolation, and alpha ketoglutarate is shown here in yellow. I've put an asterisk next to the asparagine 151i and valine 225n residues that were part of the triple mutant that performs halogenation. And this just shows you how proximal these residues are to alpha ketoglutarate in the active site. So we also wondered, what if we graft these entire two beta strands into the hydroxylase? Could that make a more active halogenase variant? So we designed a chimera based on our shuffle results. And what we did is to take the sequence of the hydroxylase, which is shown here in gray, and we lined it up with our shuffle results. Then we looked at the shuffle results and at any position that was extremely highly conserved in our halogenase library, we grafted those positions from the halogenase into the hydroxylase. So the parts of the sequence that come from the halogenase are shown in red. This gave us a sequence which we call CHI-14 or Chimera-14 because it differs from the hydroxylase by only 14 residues and is 93.5 identical in sequence to the wild-type hydroxylase. We cloned, expressed, and purified CHI-14 and assayed its activity, and we're really excited to see that CHI-14 has comparable activity and selectivity to that of the wild-type halogenase. Furthermore, it only differs from the hydroxylase by 14 residues, so we're really beginning to narrow down the key sequence components that lead to the divergent reaction outcomes. 
And moving forward, we're really interested in teasing out mechanistically the role of these different residues in, in controlling the reaction outcome. So in ongoing work, we're collaborating with the, um, the Bollinger Krebs labs, as well as the Bull and Silicon labs at Penn State University to do mechanistic investigations. One thing that we're really interested in is doing stop flow absorption. So we can see how the rate of feral decay correlates to the differences in reaction outcome for both our wild type halogenase and hydroxylase, as well as for some of our engineered intermediates. In addition, we are interested in doing vanadyl EPR. So in this case, you're replacing the feral intermediate, which is short lived with vanadyl, which is a stable mimic for EPR. And we're really interested here in mapping out the distances and angles between the vanadyl and the substrate for the wild type halogenase and hydroxylase and for the variants. And so we're really excited to see what this reveals in conjunction with our shuffle results. To summarize, I've told you about how we discovered the halogenase BESD while working on alkyne biosynthesis and how by looking at homologs of BESD, we were able to expand the substrate scope of these enzymes to other amino acids. In work I didn't have time to talk about, we're also interested in funneling in these modified amino acids into downstream pathways to make a wide variety of products. And we're also working on structurally characterizing a lot of the variants that we've discovered. We have designed a functional screen to interrogate the mechanisms of these enzymes. And through a shuffle library, we've created a bunch of variants with varying degrees of halogenation and hydroxylation outcome that are ripe for mechanistic investigation. And with that, I would like to thank my wonderful advisor, Michelle Ching, for all of her help and guidance during graduate school. And I'd like to thank the grad students, postdocs, and undergraduates in the lab, but specifically Jorge Martin, who started the Alkyne Biosynthesis Project, Eli Kissman, with whom I worked very closely on crystallography, Cameron Swenson, a great rotation student in our lab, and Kiara Sumida and Nico Sample, who are undergraduates who worked on this project. Dr. Jeff Pelton helped us with NMR characterization of the products of the halogenases, and the Marletta Lab and many others gave me crystallography advice. And I would also like to thank a number of people at Penn State University, so Amy Bull, Marty Bollinger, Kirsten Krebs, Alexi Sadoklov, and their students, Molly, Jeff, Eli, and Jabongsu, who were really fantastic hosts when I was able to visit the lab a couple of years ago now. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thanks, Monica, for a really uh, brilliant talk and uh, brilliant work also. Um, Anthony, did questions come in? Yeah, yes, they have. So uh, I think Chris Pryor has a question again. Do you, do you want to speak out loud, Chris? Sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Monica. Um, this is really fantastic stuff. Um, I was just wondering. I think it's um, I think it's Amy Bull who, in in the work she was doing with her halogenases, was seeing that there was um, you know, had this hypothesis about the serine residue. Um, that may interact with the with the iron hydroxide in that case and partition and 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 favor the halogenation that way. I was wondering, do you see a residue that's potentially having that role in in the enzymes you've looked at? Yeah, we that's a great point. We do think that um, our asparagine two twenty five may be analogous to her serine one eighty nine that she sees in well five. Okay, there's their uh, similar position. We, their position, yeah, we think that ours is positioned as well, that it could be hydrogen bonding to affect the orientation of the intermediate. Okay, thanks. Monica, could I ask a question? Anthony, sorry, I, can I jump in with one just because it maybe relates to that? So the, um, the picture we got from CIRB2 was that, you know, the hydrogen abstraction was really terrible. It was really slow. And we viewed that as necessary to allow for the specificity. So, you know, this idea of correlating rate constants for hydrogen abstraction with outcome on the basis of that work makes a lot of sense. But other people, including us before that, had entertained the idea of dynamics, where you could make a ferrule that's positioned well to remove the hydrogen it's supposed to remove. And if you did some rearrangement after fast enough to prevent the rebound from happening, you could then, so what's your view on whether, do, do you see any reason to think that there might be some dynamics sort of midstream that would uh, enable both a, an efficient hydrogen abstraction and selective halogen transfer? That's a really good question. So if I recall from the well of five work, it seems like 
there almost has to be some sort of rearrangement or the hydroxyl group would be quite a bit closer and more favored to rebound. It seems based on the structure of best D that even in the absence of rearrangement, the distances are more comparable. It's like 3.8 versus four angstroms rather than the hydroxyl being significantly closer. So I'm not sure in our case, that's com a completely necessary for there to be a rearrangement, but I'm hoping that we will get to visit you and do some investigations and hopefully figure out what's going on with, with these enzymes as well. Okay, uh, Wolfgang, uh, I think you might be on mute already if you can ask your question. Okay, thank you. Do you hear me? Yes, yes perfect. Yes. Okay, uh, great talk. Uh, fascinating results. Absolutely great. I was wondering, um, in the cases where you see hydroxylation and chlorination, and does the concentration of the chloride in solution influence this ratio? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, we have not tried systematically varying the concentration of chlorine in the buffer. We've kept it pretty high, just in, in great excess of the enzyme, but we haven't tried uh, lower concentrations and seeing how that affects the outcome. But that could be interesting to do as well. What, what, what concentration did, uh, are you using? We have at least five millimolar added. Okay. Okay. Um, can you give me can you give me an idea? Uh, what are the typical uh, turnover numbers for of your enzyme? Oh yeah. So my my lab mate Eli was just looking at this more recently, and I, th I think for the halogenases, he's seeing up to four hundred and fifty turnovers. Okay. So they're not amazing, but they're not terrible. Great. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Can I comment okay. on the on the chloride? Oh, so am I. Um, so Jeff has actually been looking at that recently, Monica, and mm. trying to look at the linkage between chloride and lysine binding in, in BESD. And I, I think there may be some. So you might imagine that um, setting up the reactive complex uh, might depend a little bit on the chloride concentration as well as the lysine concentration. But it's probably true that once you actually react with oxygen that there, you know, you need to have chloride there. So it probably you might see an effect on overall rate, but I'm not sure you would see an effect on the reaction selectivity. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so we have a couple more questions. One in the chat from Kamesh. Um, can you, can, that, can best, halogenations with best or other halogenases be used to do fluorinations or iodinations? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So um, Marty's lab has actually shown that these enzymes can do azidation and nitration. Uh, so he's done that with CRB2 and we were able to get Bestie to do that as well. We did try fluorination and that did not work. Um, and so, so I don't think that they can do that yet. Okay, thanks. And we have a question from Eli. Did you make any attempt to characterize the mode of O2 addition to the native hydroxylase and halogenase, so are the two OG binds 20 degrees apart? Could you repeat the question? Did the you make any sorry, did you make any attempt to characterize the mode of O2 addition to the native hydroxylase and halogenase is where the two OG binds 20 degrees apart? Oh, I see. Okay, we have, we have not done that yet. We have not looked at that oxygen addition step in those two cases. Okay, so if there are no more questions coming. Maybe I could just ask one last one, Monica, if you don't mind. Um, so you've, you very nicely showed the importance of this, uh, this additional hydrogen bond. Um, do you believe it's important for controlling, because obviously one, one of the challenges here is that you need the ferrule to do the CH abstraction, but then you have to prevent the rebound. Do you, do you think that the hydrogen bond is control, subtly controlling positioning of the um, iron hydroxide, or do you think it actually perturbs the electronics, which slows down the rebound step? Yeah, that's, that's something that I've always had a little bit of trouble thinking about because you would think that, um, I, I don't know if that interaction can make that bond more labile. I don't know how to think about it relative to stabilizing that so it doesn't rebound versus making it more labile by affecting that 
iron oxo bond. So I'm not sure, um, but that's something that I think is really interesting. Yeah, I think it's not obvious which way it goes, but uh, I don't maybe, know. Maybe, maybe, maybe modeling maybe will tell us. Mm -hmm. 